Hallelujah. Turn around and smile at somebody. Pretend you're friendly. Amen. I'll let I'll let the uh, evangelist. I, I really want you to share that 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 story about uh, Gabby's Gabby's sons, two sons this morning. I love. Did you hear about uh, Elijah? I just I, I'll, I, you're gonna you're gonna share that. I won't do that. I start. To, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let him do that. Amen. Why don't we stand to our feet tonight and let's just worship the Lord. God is good. Come on. And all the time, my God is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, it's funny. I, I sit here and I look out across this, this congregation and the Holy Spirit just starts talking to me. I just want you to look around and see. Just look around. Make eye contact with your neighbor. <clears throat> Come on. Discern the body. Discern the body. I, am, I, am ex I, I love doing life with you guys. We're going we're gonna to get to spend eternity in heaven together. Well, for some of you anyway. <laughs> you know, uh, typically, you know, 10% on a, uh, on a Sunday morning, I figure. You know, we'll, 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 we'll crank that up to maybe 50% of you here. Yeah, yes, yes, my brother. I... Well, praise God. Amen. I, 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 I've heard, I've heard somebody say before, we just got an egg broke in him. You, 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 you'll have to, you'll have to pour in oil and the wine here tonight, uh, Pat, before it's all over with. Uh, not, he's Pat, you're Gene. Yeah, that's a, amen, amen, whatever your name is. Praise God, amen. I just, I, I really do, I appreciate, I appreciate the, the move of God this morning. And, uh, you know, guys, it, it becomes, uh, I don't know about you, but for me, more and more necessary every time that we get together that we just, we press a little higher, a little farther. And God, I just, I just, I, it's, it's not that I'm, I don't think that he does, what he did this morning wasn't good enough. But let me tell you something, I, I need, I need something more. I need more. It's, it's Moses that would go and, can you just get fathom this? Go into that tabernacle and talk to God as a man talks to his friend face to face and come out of that meeting and say, oh, but I want, I want to see you. Come on. <laughs> like, I, I'm like, what are you talking about? No, no, no. There's something, there's something more. I, I've, I've seen him. I've experienced his presence, but there's more glory there. There's, it's, a, it's a little deeper. So, Father, my, tonight, my, my prayer tonight is that you take us a little, a little bit deeper. That, Lord, you, you bring, a, a, yes, a maturity where I don't, I don't have to see that fire and that cloud uh, to, to get up out of bed in the morning and to, and to walk with you. But, Lord, I, I, sh I sure love hearing that little still, small voice behind me saying, walk this way. So, Father God, speak to us. Lord, just to let your presence and your glory fill this place tonight. Lord, we're going to be careful to give you thanks, praise, and glory for it. For we ask all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Pray this prayer before we quit. Lord, bless my neighbor here. Amen. Pray over that one to, the, to your right and to your left. Father God, they, Lord, I know they need a manifestation in their lives. So God, just show up. Show up. Show up in their lives, Master. Hallelujah. 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 Father, just flow like a river. Let that river flow. Let that river flow. Jesus' name. Huh. Wow. Go ahead on. I do, uh, just before we start singing these songs, I just love looking out and I love singing all these that row of young people. I think that's awesome to see in the house of the Lord. There's many things you could be doing tonight on your summer break, but you chose to be in the house of the Lord. And I just want to encourage you real quick. I just want to say just one thing. I was telling Miss Sandra that uh, whenever I was in youth and, and I was speaking one night and I, I asked our youth band 
if we could sing trade in my sorrows and look what the lord has done because it was going kind of with my message and they said those are all old songs and we always do that song and i was like what you can't say that and the lord just over the years the lord you know keeps speaking to me and and i've been reading books about worship and everything and one thing that all of us need to know whether you're young or old or middle-aged is that the same God that inspired that song, Amazing Grace, is the same God that inspired the song, The Blessing, that we sang this morning. Amen. Amen. And, and nothing hurts me more when people complain about worship. Yeah. Because when we complain about the songs and how it goes, I just can't stand it. Because that just shows that, that your heart's not where it needs to be. You don't understand what true worship is. Come on now, preach. And, and whether you are young, middle-aged, or old, we need to understand what true worship is. True worship is our response to the revelation of, of who God is. So do you know God? Do you know who he is to you? So, so we may, you know, to the young, these, these songs are old, and to the old, these songs are it, you know. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It do, do, does your worship glorify the Lord? Do the words glorify God? Does it edify the body of believers? And that's what it's about. And, and worship is not just about music and singing. It's a lifestyle. And it doesn't matter, just like mentioned many times, especially here recently, it doesn't matter how high you jump on a Sunday morning, Sunday night, but how you walk it out. Yeah. Yeah. How are you acting tomorrow after you just stood in here saying, he's alive and I'm covered by the blood, and then you walked out? the same and doing things you don't need to be doing that's not what real worship is so i pray tonight that the lord finds true worshipers in this house true worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth true worshipers that will lift up the mighty name of jesus true worshipers who will shout to, to their loudest i'm alive because he's alive i'm covered because of what he did on calvary hallelujah hallelujah he has shown his awesome power. He has triumphed mightily. He has broke the chains that bound us. Amen. So how many of you are alive tonight? Alive. I'm alive because he's alive. Alive forevermore. Amen. Alive.
It's right there. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we praise your name. We praise your name. Come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. Say, I praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord. I praise your name. I praise your name. It's a sacrifice of praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I praise your name. I praise. Come on now, just in your own way. Come on, in your own way, just love on him. Love on him. Shut up, out of us.
We bless you, Jesus. life. Father God, you, you started a good work in us. And the promise of your word is you will see that all the way through to the end. I'm persuaded <laughs> that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. So Lord, I thank you today that I put these things in your hands and they're safe there. And I trust you for what you're doing. In the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. God is a good God. How many of you believe that? No, 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 no. You really believe that. You really believe that. I'll tell you something. Everything God's ever done for me has been good. He's never done me wrong. Come on. That's my testimony of my Lord. He's never done me wrong. Amen. I, I, have, I have gone through the valley of the shadow, and in the middle of that valley, I found out he got there before I did. Come on. And <laughs> When I get there one day, <laughs> Lord being my helper, I'm going to go. I hope, you, I hope to take a few of you with me. But we'll sing the, the, the words of that old song of the church, the old hymn of the church. It will be worth it all. When we see Jesus, amen, <laughs> life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. Here, one glimpse of his dear face, all, say all sorrow, all sorrows will erase. So pilgrim, bravely run this race till we see Christ, amen. Come on, give him praise. The evangelist, the man of God, amen, going to come preach to us tonight, hallelujah. Tell your neighbor it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it all. Glory, glory, glory. I want to I wanna remind you, amen, tomorrow night the most important, not that this meeting here is not important, but tomorrow night the most important meeting of the week, and that is our Monday night prayer meeting. Amen. I don't know how many we had last week, 40 or more. I mean, we, God, God showed up, amen, as we just pressed in. So that's Monday night. Wednesday night, we're going to be doing our watermelon outreach. Uh, get here at 630 if all possible. We need to, uh, and I need a lot of strong backs and weak minds. So if you've got children, bring them. And because uh, we're going to we're going to get three or four trailers, distribute 250 watermelons between uh, uh, three or four trailers. And we're going to go out here and we're going to bless and pray over this community. Amen. We're going to utilize what God has given us. He's deposited something in us. And we're going we're going to distribute that to this community. Everybody said amen. amen. With that, let's give thanks to, to God for the man that he sent us tonight. Amen. amen. Brother Gene, something. Thank you, Pastor.
Wow. Well, to God be the glory. Great things she hath done. My, 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 my. And uh, Sister Myrtle gave me my uh, watermelon early. Right out of her patch. I'm t oh, it's beautiful. Uh, car's locked. Don't run towards the parking lot. I'm just telling you. Oh, my, my, my. My goodness. Emmanuel, Saloma. I, I, I tell you then. Is, uh, we're missing a son tonight, aren't we? I tell you, I'm, oh, good-looking boys. I used to look at good. Man, it's a shame when gravity takes over your body. Oh, my. Uh, boy, Keith, bless you. That's always a joy to see you. Man, brought your daughter with you tonight. It's that's sweet. That's <laughs> 19 May of 1980, Mona and I walked into Lake Forest Assembly of God, and they needed a pastor, and all six of them showed up to, to hear me preach. And I'll never forget Mona and I, and uh, I think um, you were carrying April in your arm, and I had, um, I had Janelle by the hand. She must have been about 18 months old. And, uh, well, we walked in there with them two little bitty girls. And those board members walked up, looked at Mona, looked at them little girls of ours, said, uh, where's your wife? <laughs> I pointed at Mona and said, that's my wife. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my, like you robbed the cradle. <laughs> and, uh. I have friends that tell me all the time, you, you know, Gene Summers, you're hen pecked. I said, you ought to see the hen that's pecking me. Are you kidding? Man, I married up. Mona, there's, they're, they're, I, I, they just love to hear from you. Won't you just greet them and tell them how much we love them? Tell them how much we talk about them. Yeah, tell them that. Yeah. Oh, I tell you, what you see, what you get with that girl. My goodness. I, you know, I, I, Pat and I, and Pat and Murdy, I, I can't, I can't how many, tell you how many times I've seen him uh, back that trailer with Murdy out directing him and telling him how to get down my driveway when they preached revivals for us. But um, he preached for me at, uh, I think, three different locations there on, on Mesa Drive whenever I was at the old Lake Forest Church. And we merged three churches together, and, and I built a new church. I was 32 years old when we went into that building program. And I'm only 39 now. Um, I um, And uh, Pat preached for us there at Old River Assembly. And he's been so kind to me. I, I was telling somebody the other day how I had to cancel him one time to go on a missions trip to India. And he was so gracious to us. And, and he has supported him and Murdy. We just, we, just, um, we just go back. And you appreciate friends like that. I, and and I, I appreciate this church loving on them. And they, they feel right at home here. And uh, he'll minister something in uh, his uh, sometimers group what what are they called prime timers i know i you know i don't i don't need, i can mess up all by myself i don't need any help it's amazing how good i can do at that it's just uh, i i love them appreciate them martha martha margaret yeah the other Margaret, I am telling you, I have been trying to lose weight, but you ain't helping. I told, I told these girls over here a while ago, I said, hey, there's only two things you can do to a spirit of gluttony, and that's cast it out or fill it up. 
man, I got on them scales. I, I love Dr. Gupta. We went and saw him the other day. We uh, got a, another uh, physical, wasn't it? He, they checked our blood, and, and, uh, and he, he told me, he said, there's something in that blood. I, I said, no, it's chicken, chicken grease probably. <laughs> Pete, old Donnie McNaughton in East Texas found out how much I love fried chicken. He said, Gene Summers. He said, your belt ain't nothing but a leather fence around a chicken graveyard. <laughs> I said, you're right, Brother McNaughton. I'll tell you, yeah, I love gospel birds. But those, uh, Mona said that if you didn't quit making those baskets bigger every year, that we're going to have to get us a pickup truck. And uh, I, uh, Brother Rod Vincent, and, uh, he sent me a picture He's in uh, Chicago. Thank you, Pat. He's in Chicago. And and uh, pa Pastor Ham Parker is a friend of mine as well. And the um, he is the, the lead bishop over the uh, the Travelers Church. And he's their, their superintendent. And he's pre Rod's preaching for him this week. And Rod sent me a picture of the, the basket. And this is on... Uh, Antonio Zavaras from Louisiana gets this uh, text. Of course, I'm in the text. Rod Vincent, uh, Terry Green, Evangelist Terry Green in Missouri, and Dan Parker over in Tennessee. All five of us on there. And I took your basket, put it against the door, that white background, took a picture of it, and said, Rod, please don't be sending us pictures of those little things that they're sending to you. <laughs> You know, whenever I've got this in my room, he wouldn't hardly answer me half the day. And uh, so uh, I tell you, it's, uh, it's wonderful. And I know you do that for him when he's here. Thank you, Pastor. I love this man of God. I told Mona, I said, the people in that church love us. And, and she said, yeah, they, they genuinely love you. You don't come somewhere or you know, fit over 15 years unless people really receive from you and love you. And uh, I said, the reason being is that the pastor loves us and, and gives us this honor. And so I, I appreciate y'all. Thank you so much. I, I tell you, I sure needed you during the pandemic too. And uh, pastor, he had scheduled me for a Sunday night worship service and, and we got canceled because of the pandemic. And, um, and, and I'm telling you, this man of God sent me a check from your church anyway. To, and I cashed it. <laughs> so my check to Kroger would be good. And, uh, oh, my goodness. So I, I thank you so much. I, I love y'all. Uh, and I hope that is displayed in this pulpit when God prepares my heart to preach to you. And, I, preached, I, I think I preached this message here years ago, and, and I tied my testimony to it. But God's been speaking to me all day. I just I believe there are people that, through this pandemic, have walked in unsurety. And you, you've wondered if you've been want, walking in the right direction. And, and, and the Lord just has been speaking into my spirit to preach out of this text, out of Revelation, the first chapter. And uh, so I want to go there quickly and... And, and I want to read to you. Pam, thank you for making the accommodations for us like you do each year. And, and uh, I don't think Pastor really invites me. Pam just writes me in. And, and uh, so for what, whatever reason, Mona and I have befriended you and you love us, we thank you so much. Nice room, and it's, it's, it's great. I, I just thank you so much. It beats sleeping in my car all oh, to pieces. I, Amen. Revelation, the first chapter, and I want to begin with that ninth verse. And uh, Murdy, if this gets past his uh, bedtime, you could just carry him on the house. I listen to him plenty of nights. I, John, both your brother and and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island 
that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Where else would you be on the Lord's day? I, I don't get it. I went to preach in one of these cowboy churches. Great church. I'm thrilled to be invited anywhere. I preached for a Christian Missionary Alliance church in, uh, in uh, Milroy, Pennsylvania. And uh, mm, I didn't get an amen at all in that church. My goodness. It was, but they told me later, said, We'd really love for you to come. We, they, they really, they don't have a sound system. They said I was so loud. They would open the windows for the Amish to hear me on the hillside. I had, they said a half a mile away that it echoed across that valley. I, I love to, I, I love to preach anywhere, but I, I, I tell you, I, I get, I get invited to some of these churches to preach and, and, uh, I, I just think, I see people miss church for so many reasons. I just tell, I wanted you to know that when I was living in sin, I knew how to make up good excuses to miss church. Somebody decided to write a song. Excuses, excuses. You hear them every day. And the devil, he'll provide them if from church you'll stay away. Yeah, don't ever do preach that again here. I got a pen here somewhere. I'll tell you, I, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see write in a book, send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea, or if you're from East Texas, Laodicea. Ease up, I'm teasing. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, or the church that's represented here, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand yes, on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Father, we just thank you tonight for another opportunity to preach this gospel. I rebuke fear that has taken hold not only of this country, but God of this community and our church. I rebuke you, devil. Get thee behind us. I pray, Father, God, right now, that you take the enemy by his nappy neck and cast him out of a, this place and put him away from us. And Father, we're getting ready for a, your call, your trumpet blast, the voice of the archangel. And God, we're ready for you to come. We say, even so, Lord, come. I pray, Lord, send your anointing now upon your servant as you have already anointed your word. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. And amen. I, I, I want to preach about God's presence in difficult times. Squire Parsons wrote a song that, that just blesses me so much. 
I've never, I don't believe I've, I've ever had uh, uh, an opportunity to, to sing that song. And, and uh, I've had several requests in churches. Normally, I would sing anyway. But I love the words to this. That gulf that separated me from Christ my Lord was, was so vast the crossing I could never ford. From where he was, I, or where I was to his domain, it seemed so far. I cried, dear Lord, I cannot come to where you are. But the chorus of that th thing says, he came to me. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. I'll tell you that's been the testimony of my life. When it seemed like we were going down for the third time, my baby brother, Brian, I, it's tough to call a 60-year-old man your baby brother, isn't it? But I tell you, when he was just a child, I think he told me recently he was three years old, out behind Dad's church, old Gospel Herald Assembly of God. And, and, and the, uh, if Brian was, uh, he was a 60 model, so it must have been 1963, and he fell into our pond behind our house. And, and, it, and it, the slope went from three feet, and it was just marginal. It, there wasn't much of a ledge in that old pond. And he stepped off the bank into that pond as a, our little baby boy, little baby brother. And at three years of age, quickly slipped into nine feet of water. It went from, from three feet deep to hardly a bottom for him. And he went off into that. I happened to be walking across the, back, uh, the backyard at that time. Ten-year-old Gino. And I, I, uh, the same year that I shook hands with John F. Kennedy. Just a ten-year-old little boy scout, a uh, cub scout. I, I remember hearing Brian begin to cry out. And I heard that faint voice. I heard the gurgling. He had gone down once. He had gone down twice. He came up and was about to go down the third time. He said, and I felt a warm hand reach through that water and get a hold of my hand. And it was my big brother. And boy, he pulled me out. He said, he had. I tried to kill him more times after that. Threw him out of a, of the, I was sitting by a pretty girl on the church, uh, not the church band, the school bus when we got to ride it all the way to school when we weren't fighting. Man, I'll tell you, I, a pretty girl wanted me to sit down by her and Brian got that, tried to get in front of me when I thought him out of the seat, cut a gash over his head. I remember dad never, dad never hit us with an open fist. But he, I remember him picking me up like a sack of feed and he said, well, how did you throw Brian? Was it like this? And I remember he throwed me all over that backyard. I, want, I said, why don't you just slug me and get this over with? I'm not having a bunch of fun. That was in 1969. And I'm thinking, why didn't I let that little sucker drown? How many times I've thought that, that we were going down and the desperation was in our voice. And, and, and yet... We, there's been times that, and you have felt it, you have sensed it too, and you didn't seem to know where that warm hand was coming from, but somehow you seemed to reach up instead of reaching down. Have you ever known that they, how can you imagine what it must feel like to somebody that is going down? And they're, they're, there's no life there left. They can't tread water any longer. They're looking in God's face with Joshua and Dick Clary, I've never been this way before. Mona and I sat in the floor and grieve over a, a daughter running away from home for about 52 hours until the Holy Ghost showed up and told me, get out of your pity party. You know where your kid's at. There's a bunch of parents today that have lost their children and will never see them again. Boy, I'll tell you, I bowed up and became a greater man of God than ever before and recognizing that I was not in control any longer, that God had control of my kids' life. Isn't it amazing that you can trust him no matter where you're at? 
E.D. Hill said he was coming home from the hospital knowing that his wife was about to face death. And he said, me and Jesus had a good talk. He said, I don't understand this. I have preached this gospel. I have talked about you. I have built you up before the church. My wife loves you with all of her heart. And you're going to let her slip out of here and take her away from me. And the Lord spoke to him very simply and said, E.V., you have trusted me with her life. Will you trust me in her death? I'll tell you, friend, that's a what a what a word that provokes us toward trust in him even more and just come into the place where no longer we don't just believe it. We literally can see his hand at work in our life. You see, John banished to the Isle of Patmos and and by that Roman ruler Domitian. And this is no doubt one of those days where John would decide whether he's going to get bitter or get better for what he's facing in life. I, 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 how many of you understand that many times we're in places of, of difficulty not because we did something wrong. John, the ninth verse, reveals to us why John is on the Isle of Patmos on the Isle of Patmos at what, verse 9? For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Helps me to know that many times we get in the places that we're at and, and in total combat with the enemy of our soul, not because we did something wrong, but many times because we did something right. You have an enemy. I, I thought this morning... You don't have to wait around for some curse of the past to overtake you. How many of you understand that? You have a natural born enemy. Uh, Arco Chemical exploded um, while Mona and I were at Disney World, oh goodness, 1991, and, and killed a, a, the little drummer in our church. 90 days before, I, 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 he, I, I stood and presided over their wedding. Him and Lori got married, and, and, and now... Uh, he is among one of those 17 men. I remember talking to my secretary over the phone when she called us, and, and I said, I, I didn't have anybody working out there. And she said, yes, yes, you did. And uh, Steve Mendel, was, he, he's one of those 17. They hadn't found his body yet, but he's presumed dead. I went with his, at the time, his father-in-law, and, and Brother Brown and I walked in that funeral home, and walked up to that lifeless body and a flash fire that went through that plant. I, I, it, it, it killed him so quickly. And they said it was like you had microwaved uh, 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 something in your kitchen to get ready uh, uh, for a meal because he, when he died, he had one of those old red work rags. I, I know you, you've seen them before. And they went, they went to try to pry his fingers off of that thing and his body began to, to just disintegrate and come apart and and all they did is is dust his body with with something for male to hide and 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 then put him in that box to bury him and, and Lori never had a chance to tell her three-month uh, husband uh, goodbye and she never had an opportunity to know that it, this was the end of it all. I'm just telling you, I walked into that congregation. I, I remember leaning over to my dad. In, in three services, we ministered to 6,000 people out there at the plant. They chose me. They came to the, the funeral I preached, and, and the superintendent walked up and said, uh, uh, the, the, suit, the big guy in, in, in Philadelphia at headquarters heard what your message was about today and he wants you to, to come preach that. I went and buried that boy that day and, and the next day I went out to the plant. I've never seen such devastation in all my life. The grief strickenness in the people, the 6,000 people and I, I, you would watch the family, service after service we did that day as they grieved. It seemed like we were putting them through it all over again. People that worked with them, people that knew them from the control rooms and, and different places in there. Uh, literally the security force that was there 
that looked uh, just, just stargazed because they, they couldn't understand how something so devastating could happen in their plant. I remember preaching that boy's funeral and telling them, I don't believe that anybody in these plants out here ever designs or ever decides one day it'd be a good day for a plant to go up into explosion. And I began to explain to them that long before they were ever born, that, that you had an enemy. His name is Satan, and he's got demonic forces. I tell you, that superintendent told me it was that message that turned my heart around and decided to move me towards having you speak to our people. I, I'm just telling you, those were devastating times. How can you get any lower? than losing your mate and never getting to say goodbye. Many of them that left work at 5.30 in the morning n never dreamed that in that shutdown that they had going on that they would never see their loved one again. I'm just telling you, there are tough and hard difficulties that take place in people's life. And John just wanted you all to know that when difficult times come your way and when you've prayed every prayer that you know to pray, that you've used everything in Christendom that you've ever been taught from little young Sunday school on, I am telling you, John wants you to know that when you cannot get to him, that Jesus will find a way to come to you. And on the Isle of Patmos, John discovered that the Lord would come to you. He came to him in three different ways. First, he came to him as a comforter. In verse 18, in the NIV, he said, Do not be afraid. And John said, when he made that statement, he laid his right hand on me. I want you to pause for a moment and think about the authority and the power in the right hand of God. Peter preached in Acts 5 and 31 that there was exaltation power in the right hand of God. Speaking about Jesus, him had God exalted with his right hand so he would be a prince and a savior. There's always been encouragement by the right hand of God. Stephen, with stones dashing out his life, would look into the heavens and his testimony was, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Peter speaking, not simply in defense, but I tell you, in offense, going against the enemy, declares about Jesus, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. And John said, that was it. It was that right hand that he laid upon me. My grandmother, what a, what a gal. Pat, did you meet Ma? Oh, my. Everybody needs a Ma. She's married to Paul. Oh, goodness. Anybody re remember the Houston Coliseum? Man. Paul, I, I, I don't know that he ever went to school. I don't know that. Worked as a in service stations. Remember when you come out and fill your tank and wash your windshield and get full service? Wow. Paul worked for, I think it was Conoco and back in the day. When I was, a, I was a little old bitty boy, I think I was four or five years old, and Paul heard that Roy Rogers, Dale Evans, Pat Buttram, and Nellie Bell. Anybody remember Nellie Bell? That's the Jeep. Whew. They were coming to the Houston Coliseum. My Paul put in overtime and bought five or six tickets for us, our family. I don't think Russell had even discovered America yet. <laughs> Man, he took us out. He went and bought me, bought me jeans and boots, cowboy hat, six guns. Woo! Took me down to the rail so I could shake hands with Roy Rogers. Man, old Trigger never looked better. God, I, what a show. I love my Ma and Pa. When I got kicked out of the house, uh, Dad gave me the right foot of fellowship. 
Some of y'all got to leave home with American tourist or luggage. Mine had a twist tie at the top of it. They put it in a garbage bag and gave it to me. I moved in with, next door with my grandparents. And Ma, big woman, big gal. Ooh. Get up in the middle of the night. That's three o'clock in the morning. Pray. Oh, God, save Gene. Save that boy. You know he's going to hell. That's what you want to hear out of your grandmother at 3 o'clock in the morning when you're 18 and 19 years old. I told Mona one time, we were dating at the time, I said, I about got saved several weeks ago just to shut her up. That's why I was so blessed this morning that, you know, Noah come up and got saved this morning and gave his heart to the Lord. My instructions to him when he left up here as, as I told him, I said, now, Noah, you, you know what the Lord wants you to do from here on? What? And I said, the Lord wants you to go tell your family members. Tell, tell them what the Lord did for you. And, and I didn't pick out anybody in particular. He left from right there, Pastor, and went back and told Elijah, hey, you need to get up there and get saved. <laughs> Elijah marched himself up here, and I said, who's this? He said, he's my little brother. I said, my Lord... No, you're not but nine. He said, yeah, but, but my little brother needs to get saved. Boy, I tell you, we led him in a sinner's prayer, and his name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I, I want them to remember that. I believe every church member in this church don't belittle the things of people's youth as well as your own. Go to those kids and tell them how proud you are that they got right with God. They stray away from the Lord. That same Holy Ghost that has convicted you and brought you back here will bring them kids right back here. Come on. Amen. My ma. Oh, I loved her so much. Paul passed away in 1977 at 77 years old. He was a 1900 model. I miss him. He told me right before he died. He said, I know you want to go see Jesus, and I know you want to see the Father, and I know, I know God's going to make you a great preacher, boy, kiddo. I love you. He said, but when you come through the gates, when you look over to your right, I'll be standing there waving you on through. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past. Home at last ever. Yes, Maul was so, so hurt that Paul had passed. They had had a tumultuous marriage before they came back to the Lord. Ran a beer joint over on the east side of Houston. My mother at 12 years old was, had, had been, as an 8-year-old, had walked down to what is now Christian Temple. And, of course, Brother uh, E.M. Yates would, had been the pastor there for 50 years. My mother walked down as a child, went to Sunday school, that old Assembly of God church down in that old community just off of Harrisburg. And, and she loved the Lord with all of her heart. Here she is doing her homework under the, a flashing neon sign. Sound like a country song, doesn't it? But boy, they, and she, the Spirit of the Lord came on her and moved on her, and she said, Lord, if you'll help me get out of this atmosphere, I will never, I will see to it that my children will never have to go. And it's why it broke her heart, Keith, when I went and decided to go back into the honky tonks. The same reason that it broke my heart when one of my kids, after living for the Lord, had to say, yeah, I'm telling you, you want to go, you young people, you want to go to breaking hearts? You go ahead and start breaking God's commandments and breaking ranks from this church and going places you ought not be going to. You'll not only hurt yourself, you'll hurt a bunch of your people. I'll tell you, Mom, Ma was so hurt, and it, it wasn't two, two years later, and she met James Nelms. He was a correctional officer up at, up at the Walls unit in Huntsville. She loved to tell everybody about, about man, I'm, I, he carries a, a submachine gun on that wall. And, boy, he's an officer. And, boy, she was so proud of him. 
and, and she, they dated for a little bit. He led worship in his church at Trinity Tabernacle Assembly of God in Trinity, Texas. I preached there. It's a great little church there. And, and boy, she was just so excited. I'll never forget the day Ma came in and, and tells all of us and says, this is my fiance. I didn't know she knew French. And to which her oldest grandson would yell out, I said, you're pregnant, aren't you? <laughs> Boy, she clasped her heart like Fred Sanford. Now, she took off chasing me around that house. I'm going to kill you if I get my hands on you. I, man, I'll tell you, she was so mad at me. Same woman. They, I'd blow the clutch out of that 66 Chevrolet Supersport. 396 with pop-up pistons, dual line holly. <laughs> Boy, two-inch exhaust ports on that thing. Man, I, I, I tell you, she, I, I come in, Ma, I, I, I blowed the clutch out on that old car again. And, and I need a new transmission. I need a clutch, pressure plate, throw-out bearing. Remember, guys, when we could work on that stuff? Remember that? And boy, she said, well, honey, what's it going to cost? I said, Ma, it's expensive. Man, I've got to go buy all them parts. That's $22. And she'd go to the bank. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't trying to be offensive. I'm just telling you where her bank was. But I'm t <laughs> she'd pull out and she'd, I'll tell you, that's my mall. The second year of her and James's marriage, he got cancer. I would preach his funeral. I remember when they pronounced him gone, my dad and I standing at his bed over in Northeast Houston. All I could think about is I gotta break the news to my grandmother. This man had been her knight in shining armor. Where her and Paul had never had the money to do anything, James had a great job. He took her all over Louisiana for their honeymoon, took her all over Oklahoma, it was just a, a, a marriage, a beautiful marriage, and, and she loved him, and, and he loved her. didn't matter that she was 10 years older than him. He needed to be younger. <laughs> I remember the day after his funeral, Mom said, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe I can do that. I said, what, Mom? She said, you're grandmother's wanting to go back to her mobile home up in East Texas, a little community called Sebastopol, about nine miles out of Trinity. And, and I said, well, I, I'll take her. It's only 90 miles, hour and a half. I, goodness, I'll, I'll get up there. Evangelist driving, I can make it an hour and ten minutes. And uh, I carried up there. We talked. She was just talk to me. I could tell she's grieving. Got her up there to her mobile home, and I got all of her stuff carried in out of the back of my little old car, and I got it to her house, and, and I tried to leave. And she would walk out on the porch, lay her head down on the banister rail of that old porch, and she'd go to grieving. You could hear her. My grandmother was never quiet. I'd, I'd get out of that car and I'd run back up on the porch and I'd love on her a little bit. Take her, it happened three times, folks. And I, I'm getting a little weary of this and, and I understand, but, but my goodness, I need to get back home. Finally, I was able to leave her in the house long enough. I bailed off in that car and took off. The next day, my mother calls me and said, hey, um, um, have you talked to your grandmother today? I said, oh, no. No, Mom, I haven't. I, she said, well, I have. She's going to be calling you. Said, okay, I'll be ready for it. It wasn't, it wasn't an hour or so. My grandmother calls me, and she gets to talking to me, and if I can use an English term very loosely here, she sounded very up, very chipper. There's an English term for you, chipper. And I said, finally, I'd about had enough. I said, wait a minute. Is, is this the same woman? that I dropped off at her little mobile home yesterday? Well, yes. I said, well, you broke my heart yesterday. Huh? And I said, what, 
remember? And she said, oh, that. And I said, yeah, you, you tore me up. It, it, I, I prayed for you all the way home. She said, amazing thing happened. She said, I, I, got, I was sitting there, and man, she said, uh, uh, after you left and prayed for me all that time, she said, I, I was okay. Uh, the news come on, I thought, you know, I need a cup of coffee. Now, folks, at 10 o'clock at night is not when I do coffee. Now, Mona can drink it and go to bed and sleep the night away, suck the curtains in, sound like a gutted snow goose. When I'm te It's amazing how she, me, I drink coffee at 10 o'clock at night. I'll be out here in Mulberry chasing cars till 2 o'clock in the morning. Are you kidding me? I don't need a ton of caffeine to do that. I said, yeah, Ma. She said, I got me a little cup of coffee. She said, the news went off. I said, I started walking down that little narrow hallway on the linoleum floor, and I'm going down there, and I could just close my eyes and see Ma, you know, rubbing both sides going down that little hallway. Man, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Eat her cereal out of a satellite bowl. I, I'm telling you. My ma, y'all have anybody here had a big grandma? Man, I'll tell you, if she's here, don't raise your hand. My Lord, <laughs> my goodness. And man, I'll tell you, she said, I went down that hallway. She said, son, I kept, I kept feeling it, it, it started rising up on me. I started feeling something. And I said, what, what, ma? She said, that grief, it started crawling on me again. And I just, I got to rebuking the devil, honey, and I, and I pled, pled the blood of Jesus. And she said, when I got to that bed, I threw them cur those, uh, uh, read those co uh, covers back and said, I crawled up in that bed and I pulled them up. And she said, uh, I, I began to weep a little bit. And I said, Jesus, please don't let me lapse back into this again. Please, Jesus, I need you so bad. I'm grieving. I miss that man so much. And she got to weep a little bit. She said, Jesus, please help me. And she opened her eyes. She said there was a glow in the room. She looked at the end of the bed. She said, son, it was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself had walked into my room and he walked around the edge of my bed. And she said, I was smiling like a mule eating briars. She said, I was grinning so big. And he reached over and she said, Gene, he put his right hand on my shoulder and said, Sarah, don't be afraid. I tell you, I, boy, when I heard that, I can imagine John on the Isle of Patmos when the Lord walked up there letting him know I've got a purpose in your life. The reason that you're going through hell on earth, they couldn't kill you in the oil pot over there. You kept preaching against sin. I still believe he that sinneth is of the devil. That's what John wrote in the epistles. And he put Domitian, put him on that island. I tell you, the devil wants to take you when you have decided to follow Christ and hold high carnival with your life. But he comes to you as a comforter like he did my grandmother. I remember the night. I was telling Pat about this. I, I was walking the floors. Man, answer the call to ministry. Hey, you won't, if you've never had a real fight with the devil, just let the Lord lead you into something. Hey, girl, how about it? Just let the Lord lead you into some kind of call of ministry on your life and watch what the devil will do. He decide to hold high carnival with your life. He will do his best to take you down. Man, after six months of being without work, I built a new home. I got two little girls, one still in a bassinet down there, and I'm fixing to go take my first church. I don't know all the good stuff that's coming, but I know the bad stuff that's happening right now. This ain't good. Yeah. And Janelle, when she was born, had colic in that same house for the first six months of her life. I put her head in my hand. Mom was wore out during the day. I'd come home at night, walk the floors with that baby in my arms, a leg hanging here and a leg over here hauling that baby up and down them hallways singing, there is a river that floats. Why? I remember how thrilled I was when Reagan 
use Janelle's favorite word, whatever, when she was growing up. I said, there is a God. Well, I, 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 I remember going through that difficult time. About lost my home. God, anybody remember Chevy Chevette? Huh? Mo, Mona was oh, the mission net leader in Dad's church, and I was over the Royal Strangers. And on Wednesday nights, Dad got to complaining. Y'all got more kids out there, and we got people in the auditorium. Well, that ain't my fault. <laughs> man, we we thought we just knew that that man. Surely the Lord's gonna smile on us for the, all this good stuff. And, and we're going broker by, we so broke we couldn't, we broke her in the Ten Commandments. I remember walking them hallways thinking I got a house note. Remember them huge, crazy, humongous house notes of $400 a month? Huh? That Chevy Chevette that we were hauling about 30 kids to church in. I mean, you ought to have seen them with their face pressed up against that back glass on that little hatchback car. I'm telling you, and that was the girls. We'd all pop the back on that hatchback, three or four kids would pile out of that car. $99 a month for that thing, and I couldn't make the payment. I like the way you're shouting now. Didn't have the money to buy groceries. And I'm the dad of an 18-month-old and a newborn. I got to walk in them hallways, Lord. Lord, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. And I guess God got, the Lord himself just got sick and tired of me. And I, I felt in my spirit a check. I stopped. And I said, Lord, I feel like you want to speak into my spirit. And the Lord asked me, not in, I didn't hear a voice. It was in my spirit. He said, do you think you're helping me at 2 a.m. in the morning walking these hallways? I, I looked right through that sheetrock ceiling. I said, no, I don't really believe I'm helping you at all. He said, then get back down there in that bed and get in bed with your wife and your babies down the hall there and leave this to me. Well, I, I, I look back at that, that hall. I named it Worry and Discontent. And I walked in there and I got in that bed. I fell asleep. Told sound asleep. Seven o'clock the next morning, my phone rang in that, that home. And it's Lois Gildart. Oh, that's a real person. Lois Gildart. Come on, Mona, tell him. Woo! My dad. Dad's 88, so I can get away with murder now. Mom is only 85. I'm still a little scared of Mom. She was an astronomer. She put stripes on the sun. She bad to the bone. And, and I, I, I'm just telling you, Lois Gildart? She couldn't stand missionettes, could she? But she loved our boys. Man, whatever them royal strangers needed. Man, to go to them powwows and camp outs. I, I said, uh, Mona, Mona couldn't get a dime out of her. But I say, Sister Gildart, boy, we sure need some money to go to powwow. She said, baby, how much you need? Well, I'm sure $500 would do it. Of course, 300 would, but I like a little extra. <laughs> Man, she'd write that check out. Here you go. Man, I love my Royal Ranger. I said, thank you, Sister Gildart. But Dad had struggles with her. She would bring in the Houston Chronicle. And when Dad, on Sunday mornings after worship, would ask them, would you turn in your Bible to such and such chapter, she'd take that Houston Chronicle and pop it real loud, letting him know she was reading the newspaper. He, oh, man, she cooked us one time a sausage cake. Some foods were never meant to be put together. I'm just telling you, sausage and cake is not, it's just not one of them. 
and, and Russell went down to the back. Well, we had the Corps of Engineers had come behind Dad's house back in those days, and it was a, a drainage ditch to a, to a uh, rice canal. And, and Russell went out there on that high hill and took white spray paint and painted a great big circle out there, and in the middle of it wrote spot. And told Sister Gildart that night, she said, what would you think of that sausage cake? Russell said, it hit the spot. <laughs> Never forget that. Sister Gildart calls me at 7 a.m., Keith, and she said, um, I hope you slept all right last night. I said, well, I, I honestly, uh, but eventually I did. She said, well, I'm telling you, I was 2 to 2 a.m. I've been up since that time waiting for you to wake up because the Holy Ghost won't leave me alone. I said, really? She he said, the Spirit of God told me that you and Mona gave up that farm out there at Dayton and all your cattle, tractor and all your stuff so that you could go in the ministry and the devil's beating y'all's brains out. Can you come over here? You got gas enough to come get this check? My goodness, it caught me up on my house notes on that little old Chevy Chevette and Mona went down and I sat with the kids while she walked through the that store and bought us a bill of groceries. I tell you, we didn't have enough when we got through to rub a couple of quarters together. But I tell you, God met our needs. I tell you, when I couldn't get, seemed like I couldn't break through and I couldn't get to him, he visited me right there in my home. And the same time he was talking to me, he was telling somebody how to meet our needs for us. You don't think I tell you, if the hair of your head is numbered, how about your name before him? He's already got you a new name written down in glory. John said that was the hand, the right hand of God spoke to me. Fear not. Fear not in your Bibles listed 366 times. Why do you think it's there? Because God wants you to know you don't have to be afraid that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and him shall I trust. My friend, I don't, I don't know what you're facing. Can you imagine what our pastors and are, are facing and what they're going through in, in, in all of this pandemic? And I've got minister friends that I talk to week after week where, where Mona and I attend and, and used to be your presbyter down here, Donald Gibson. And he, he and I talk often and I tell him I'm praying for him. And boy, there's not any of these pastors that are trying to get anybody hurt and yet they're doing their best to follow a, a line of godliness down through that word knowing that we could take up any deadly thing and it shall not harm thee. I'm just telling you, we either believe it or we don't. came as a conqueror. Huh? He said, I hold the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Are you a conqueror? Yeah. If he's conquered his death, he says, I am alive forevermore. Well, my friend, if he's conquered his own death, then yours is not a problem. I'll tell you, walking through life, I, my dad, I, I, I think I told you all this back the last time I was here, my dad watching him go, <laughs> oh, dad. I had to sit with him the first of the year. The first of the year, he was, uh, we, we think it very well could have been this virus. May have been, but he, doctor said he was going through congestive heart failure and, and edema and all the things. My mom, in her 80s, was just wore out. I told mom, I said, hey, when I'm not preaching revival here in January, I will spell you off. We'll do every other night. And my baby brother, Brian, was able to come in on the weekends and spell us off. And, and lo and behold, uh, the, the, I, wasn't, I don't know, first or second time I sat with him, I watched him. It's 2 a.m. in the morning. He had his days and nights mixed up. And I'm just telling you, there was a day I could stay up all night. Woo! Not anymore. 
I like to lay before the Lord. Watch the back of my eyelids. Dad, I'm, I finally get a rest because he had special needs to get up and go to the restroom and do different things and he's struggling with life and and, and I'm, I'm so glad to have him around and I love him so much and, 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 and I look, he keeps looking down. They've got all the IVs over here but they this wrist, they've got his name tag and then there's a a little purple looking band that used to, any of you nurses I, I think that was the color of it purple and in white letters it said DNR he kept looking at that band he didn't want to have my dad is a brilliant man and it's probably just a lapse of memory at 88 years old finally he can't help it he said what's with this band I said what that purple band it's 2 a.m. Dad, let's go to sleep. Let's rest. I said, you know good and well what that band is. He said, no, I really don't. I said, you signed the papers. I didn't. He said, what does it mean? I said, it means, look at it, do not resuscitate. Who did, who did this? Who put that on my wrist? I said, you and Mom evidently signed the papers on this. Well, I'm talking to her when I get home. I'm not ready to check out of here yet. I'm telling you. I told Dad, I said, are you, are you worried you're not? No, I'm perfectly fine with death. But if there's a possibility that I could live a little longer, you give me CPR. I wanted to say, yeah, whenever you, I was little and you were my daddy. I needed CPS. <laughs> if he'll conquer, he's conquered his own death. Would you have liked to have been in the garden that day and just being, a, just being able to purview and stand back and watch as that stone rolled away? And the guards, his eyes fall back, the scripture says, with fear. Watching that stone, the Spirit of God himself rolled that stone out of the way. And God called his son forth out of that tomb. My goodness. Them women went looking for him the next day and met him on the road. Sir, where have you taken my Lord? dead and they I can't, I, his body's no longer there she says, girl it's me if he's overcome his own death I got a feeling everything's going to be alright he's the carrier of the keys if he has the keys that means the devil doesn't what are you so worried quit living like the devil has the keys to death, hell, and the grave. If the devil has been condemning you and telling you you're going to hell, it's a very good possibility you're actually on our side more than you are on his side. Let me read this. I'm through. Let me read this. It says right here, if not shout but now, close this thing out. I got this from a friend of mine. I want you to hear it. This is called a request for transfer. This is to Jesus Christ, my commander-in-chief, the commander of the spiritual armed forces of heaven. Dear Lord, I am writing this to you to request a transfer to a desk job. I herewith present my reasons. I begin my career as a private but because of the intensity of the battle, you have quickly moved me up in the ranks. You have made me an officer and given me a tremendous amount of responsibility. There are many soldiers and recruits under my charge, 
And I am constantly being called upon to dispense wisdom, make judgments, and find solutions to complex problems. You have placed me in a position to function as an officer when in my heart I know that I only have the skills of a private. I realize that you have promised to supply all I would need for battle. But, sir, I must present to you a realistic picture of my equipment. My uniform, once so crisp and starched, is now stained with tears and blood of those I've tried to assist and help. The soles of my boots are cracked and worn from the many miles I have walked trying to enlist and encourage instructed troops. My weapons are marred, tarnished, and chipped from constant battle against the enemy of our souls. Even the book of regulations that you gave me and I was issued have been torn and tattered from endless use. The words are now smeared. You have promised that you would be with me throughout, but when the noise of the battle is so loud and the confusion is so great, I can neither see nor hear you. I feel so alone. I'm tired. I'm discouraged. I have battle fatigue. I would never ask you for a discharge. I love being in your service, but I humbly request a demotion and transfer from the front lines. I'll find file papers in the, in the rear echelon or clean latrines. Just get me out of the battle, please, sir. Your faithful but tired servant and tired soldier. Here's the Lord's reply. It's addressed to the faithful but tired soldier of the spiritual armed forces. The location is the battlefield, and the subject is your transfer, dear soldier. Your request for transfer has been denied. Herewith present my reasons. Number one, you are needed in this battle. I can't imagine anybody bowing up and not wanting the baptism of the Holy Ghost when all the leadership of this church is crying out for help. They need you on the front lines with them. I have selected you. Secondly, I have selected you and will keep my word to supply your needs. Thirdly, you do not need a demotion and transfer. You'd never cut it in latrine duty anyway. Believe me. Fourthly, you need a period of R&R, &R, rekindling and reviving. For this reason, I am setting aside a place on the battlefield that is insulated from all the sound and fully protected from the enemy. I will meet you there. <laughs> And I will give you rest. I will remove your old equipment. And I will make all things new in your life. You have been wounded in battle, my soldier. Your wounds are not visible. But you have received grave internal injuries. You need to be healed. And I will heal you. You have been weakened in the battle. You need to be strengthened. And I will strengthen you and I will be your strength from this day forward. I will instill in you confidence and ability. My words will rekindle a flame in your spirit. You are going to have a renewed love, zeal, and enthusiasm. Report to me, you tattered and empty soldier. I will refill you compassionately, your commander-in-chief, Jesus Christ. Don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Well, I've seen a lot of good getting off places in this thing. In a good place several times, even in this pandemic, for a good place to just back out. I told Pastor today, I went to church one Sunday morning during this pandemic. I went to church four times and never left my recliner. 
never felt so useless. Pat, it just was the worst feeling I've ever had in my life. Sit there and watch my preacher buddies. I'd amen them. I don't do Facebook, but I was using Mona's Facebook, and I was amening them online. And man, some of them, Robert Hogan preached against sin. I said, my Lord, don't turn that church over to somebody else just yet. You still got it, man. I heard some of my buddies preach some of the most, the most powerful stuff and sit there, and the Spirit of God rekindled my spirit and, and caused me to go back and research and realize while we're still on the front lines, I tell you, while there's still blood running through your veins, I want you to know that Jesus, whenever you feel like you just can't go any further, he will come to you. He will assist you. He will help you. He is a comforter. He is a conqueror, conqueror and he is the carrier of the keys. Stand with me tonight. Come, Mona. Come stand with me, baby. I know they're coming to sing some choruses. I love this. Uh, I get the thrill with Jesus every moment of the day. I get the thrill with Jesus, for he's the truth, the light, the way. I get the thrill with Jesus. He satisfies my longing soul. I get the thrill with Jesus, for he's the one who makes me whole. His character never changes. He's instant in season and out. He's always there. He helped me raise some, some good kids. When Janelle went through a divorce here about three or four years ago, I, I, I thought my grandkids, I thought they were going to lose their mind. Haley lives with us now. I'll never forget that Friday afternoon she called and she's screaming over the telephone. I hate him, I hate him, talking about her daddy. I said, oh, baby, wait, that, that's such strong language. Don't do that. Didn't matter, I wanted to kill him. I remember her crying, screaming, Paul, Paul, please, come get me, please. I couldn't. I couldn't. Have you, you been there? You couldn't do anything? It's, it's no longer in your authority. It's no longer in, that, you, that's, not your, you, that's not your responsibility anymore. Oh, you can, you and I get to be around to pick up the pieces. If you're going through something, I just got to tell you, you got to get well. You've, you've got to get healed, whatever this hurt, whatever this fear has been, whatever this anxiety is. That's burnt, trying to burn you out. And whatever this weariness is that through this pandemic came over the church, or this weariness that has caused people to, uh, to fall out of love with our Lord. I'm going to tell you, my mama used to sing it. He was there all the time, waiting patiently in line. I am telling you, he's there. He, he waits for an opportunity to just bless you. The Bible says in one, Second Chronicles, his eyes are searching to and fro throughout the land. People that love and keep his commandments. And he wants to do something supernatural for your life. I don't know what you're battling. You let me come back. I know I can do better, but uh, the Spirit of God wouldn't let me out of this tonight. I sent my, my hotel today sitting over there in that corner in that chair knowing what the Lord was putting on me I did my best to keep from just breaking down and weeping listening to some music and I wish I could carry this for you we've been some difficult places me and this girl I've never we've never talked to one another in such a way we've never physically fought we had some conversations you could hear a block or two couple in our lives was going through a, a difficult time fighting physically hurting one another it was a, a battle brawl and all Moon and I could do is step back and hold their children hold their children and just quake in fear because we didn't know what to do and that baby of theirs 
looked up, looked at me and Mona and said, ain't they mean? They're being so mean, Uncle Gene, to one another. We stood there, cried, and held that baby. There's some things that are just out of my control. And I just, I, I used to be such a man. I should, used to be, have such, such control of things around our lives. And many of you are there. Some of you that have joined me in, in the 60s and 70s, in your 70s, and certainly in the 80s, that know that we're no longer in charge of these young people's lives. What they don't know is every day when they step on a bus or they go to college or when they step out in the world in their first job, that they are guided there by our prayers. That we make sure that the Spirit of God is girding them up lest they dash their foot against a stone. I know the devil tried to use that, but that's a promise of God. I want to pray for you. I just... I just want to believe God's going to do something supernatural. I, I can't preach like this and not pray for somebody. I feel like there's people here that the devil's put a target on everything sweet and good in your life. And you need some relief tonight. And Mona and I just came. We're not miracle workers, but we know him. I know the peace speaker. I know him by name. I've been able to call it. Watch my grandmother on a, on a fire, rustling my little old bitty boys, burning trash. And, and that fire took off across our 10-acre meadow there in Channel View. We raised calves and, and pigs, and, and, and we were just little boys in 4-H and, and went out there to burn the trash. And my grandmother, Ma, babbled out of that off her front porch, ran out towards the middle of that flame and said, In the name of Jesus, peace be still. I'm telling you, the holy wind of God has snuffed it out. The volunteer fire department came and they called them. Somebody did. There's no fire here to put out. All me and Russell can say is our mall prayed. I'm telling you, there's people in this church. If you're fighting a battle, there's people in this church. Oh, Brother Gene, you're leaving tonight. Yeah, but I'll tell you, the church remains. This church remains. I'll tell you, don't. Don't, don't ask for a demotion now. We need you on the front lines. Don't give up now. Haven't you heard? There's a pandemic out there. This is our time of glory. This is our time and our chance of opportunity. Don't run frightened. Don't stay away from us. I tell you, do whatever you can to stay on the front lines. We need you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus something special about that name Jesus Woo! there's some people crying out your name tonight clean your blood Jesus I pray God you do something supernatural touch some people here God calls them to come God help them know that we're going to wrap our arms around them devil you got to leave them alone devil you're a liar you tried to scare them to death. And Jesus is bringing peace that passes all understanding. You're here tonight. You say, Brother Jim, I just need God's help. I want you to step out. Say, I, I'm tired of anxiety. I'm tired of fighting this battle. Thank you, baby. Yeah, come on, somebody else. He's not the only one. Come on, you say, I just, I've got to have help. The devil's been trying to beat me up, tear me down, put a mark on me. Destroy everything sweet and good in my life, and I need God's help. Brother Gene, I need the Spirit of God to raise me up. Come on. I want to pray for you. I want to believe God for you. Some of you that are supposed to be students, and some of you, some of our kids didn't get to graduate or walk with their, with, with their class. There's all kinds of things that young people face in life. I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I, in the 60s and 70s, what me and Sister Mona went through, We've never been through what you kids have been through. You're awesome to be here on a Sunday night and believing that God's going to do something supernatural in your life. These young people that sit and listen to a voice. Hey, y'all remember back decades ago that old man 
Gene Summers used to come and preach and he just believed God could do anything. I'm praying God is instilling that in your lives tonight. Walk in that. Tonight when you go home, lay your head down and rest knowing that you got a God that never sleeps and never slumbers, that he knows your name. He knows the hair of your head, the scripture says. And it's about relationship and not statistics. You're here tonight. You need prayer. Mona and I just want to pray with you. Sweet touch of God. We're going to pray. Some of you that love to pray for others, we, we're not keeping you long. Just come. Lay your hands on somebody. Just believe God with them. A couple of ladies over here, some gentlemen here that would pray. Just lay hands on them. Let's just believe God to do something supernatural in their life. And the rest of you, would you just reach out your hand towards them? If you're wanting to find a place to pray, you feel free to do that. I'll tell you, if you have to go, please know that Mona and I love you. We appreciate you.